started. Welcome again, everybody. I'm Fimara Ahmed. I am the founder and CEO of Locale, which is a learning and development platform dedicated to advancing women at work. Uh, we provide one-to-one -one mentor matching so it's a marketplace um, matching women with leaders outside of their companies, as well as we provide community and workshops. So uh, again, thank you for uh, joining Chaitra. And just a little FYI, Chaitra is not doing well. She's under the weather, but she's still here um, to, to support us and be able to join in on this in incredible, important conversation. Um, welcome Chaitra, and uh, let's get started. Thanks, Samara, for having me. And uh, thank you all for, um, you know, being patient. I may have to cough a little bit. I have to probably a uh, little uncomfort, but I'm on the mend. I'm doing much better. But that little nasty cough doesn't want to leave me. So, oh, no. so, so again, we really, really appreciate it. We'll keep it conversational. Uh, but before we get into the questions, Chaitra, I would love to share a little bit of your bio. So um, I actually met Chaitra a couple years ago when our company was selected to participate in, in Women in Cloud, an incredible accelerator for women entrepreneurs um, in the tech industry uh, to really bridge that divide, create access to billions of dollars uh, in opportunities as part of Microsoft's initiative and Chaitra is the co-founder and I've seen firsthand how Chaitra you really champion women entrepreneurs you show up I mean today is an example and you showed up you show up and you provide the opportunities access to networks that women need so um Chaitra's bio she is the co-founder of Women in Cloud a community-led economic development organization for women entrepreneurs and professionals driven by job creation technology innovation and sustainable economic access for women she's also a public speaker who has led TEDx Microsoft and United Nations events with expertise on leadership and digital transformation Transformation. She has also been named Forbes Next 1000 Entrepreneurs and is a published author for books, uh, Hashtag Partner Tweet with Karen Fascio and Million Dollar Business with Microsoft Cloud. She believes in helping people and organizations creating access to help them achieve impact and influence of the world to become market leaders. And there's also books that if you're interested, uh, our team members will uh, drop in the chat here, uh, as well as link to Chaitra's LinkedIn. So connect with her and you'll find she is hands down one of the best uh, champions of women in tech. So welcome again, Chaitra. Um, let's get started with the question. So today's obviously event is on break the bias. There is still a lot of bias um, in the workplaces that we want to help break and uh, love to hear from you. What is the biggest bias you have been able to break about yourself? Sure, Homera. First is, I think we need to set the definition so we all agree. Um, for me personally, bias is a strong inclination of mind or a feeling or an opinion, especially one that is preconceived or unreasoned. That's kind of how I define bias. So when I think about the biases that which I actually spend more time is looking into gender bias, um, mm -hmm. appearance bias, group bias, blame bias, and confirmation bias. Those are the kind of things I'm very curious about. And I'm always curious because I want to know why people are biased about that. But the thing that I want to break off is really um, growing up, I was actually told what to do and how to behave and what my purpose should be in life, which is get married, have kids, and basically take care of the family on earth. That's, that's pretty much was that. And that was a group bias. That was the family, the culture, and everyone had a narrative for me. So when I think about the breaking, the bias for me is really the group thinking and confirming to group rules all mm -hmm. the time of what the world wants me to do instead of what I could do for the world. It's just a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I think about if I have to break the biases, really rethinking when someone says you have to do this, my first question is why me? Why, why are you forcing that on me? Or is yeah. there a reason I should be doing? So it allows me to start pondering and thinking about it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This brings back memory. So for those of you who don't know, I'm from Pakistan. I was born and raised there um, and totally resonate with a lot of what you said. It's, it's what you're going to be. It's who you're going to be. Here's who you're going to marry. And it did, did just set the life for you. So now they're probably all having a little bit of a heart attack 
<laughs> so, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to go with um, the biases because you have, you know, you have worked with, you have seen thousands of women entrepreneurs as well as women in executive leadership. What are some of the common biases you see and hear in today's workplaces that you are determined to break? Boy, that's a loaded question. I'm so I sorry. I can break something. First of all, I don't know what I'm going to break. But I think I, I would say is um, there are, these are the five biases. I think about it a lot. One is the gender bias. Mm -hmm. How does a technology um, bring um, acceleration in doing a gender divide through the algorithms that we do? So kind of like think about the mm -hmm. algorithms and how the bias is formed. Second is the appearance bias, because if you're an entrepreneur, yeah. um, if you do not fit uh, a persona of what a good entrepreneur looks like or a unicorn entrepreneur mm -hmm. looks like, then you won't get funding, you don't mm -hmm. get contracts, you don't get all this. So there's a, I would say a beauty bias is there in the tech yeah. industry. And I sometimes I always think about why do some people have that versus not? Do we have to groom? Do we not have to groom? That's kind of a constantly in the back of your mind. And COVID yeah. was really good from that perspective, right? We didn't have to go out and really dress up, perf be look perfect. We still could do business. I was like, wow, well, that was really good to break that bias. Mm -hmm. um, the third is the blame bias. And I think I suffered with that one multiple times when something goes wrong. It's very easy to find someone else to blame instead of looking at like, what did I do to, mm -hmm. you know? So that's another one that I see a lot. When something goes wrong, they're always looking for somebody to blame. Yeah. And that happens at the workplace more um, commonly than others. And now with women working from uh, a remote, the chances of them getting blamed for things will be much higher yeah. because the reason why they don't speak up or they won't say things. And that's another area I kind of ponder upon a lot. The superiority mm -hmm. bias, like I am the best, I am the right, I am here, uh, you have to do because I have, because you have to do. So it's kind of, that is another one which I ponder a lot. Mm -hmm. And the one is the confirmation bias is because we have the data, this is how you are going to do it. Instead of following the empathy model, which is yeah. inclining inside the intuitiveness and the gut feeling, but looking at data with black and white, because data is not always perfect. It gives mm -hmm. a one um, one view to it, but not yeah. everything. So when I think about all those six biases, which I'm always thinking about, really, I don't know how to uh, you know, fix any of it or which one I'm determined. But I think if I had a magic one, if you give me one, I would think I would look at exploring the standardization and normalization of the gender bias and the confirmation bias using the AI algorithms, because I think that will allow us to at least build a technology for future that becomes really good. You know, mm -hmm. today, Elon Musk just said was the AI humanoid robots are coming and Tesla is going to build them. And I'm like, oh boy, what <laughs> does that mean? What does that mean? And what does that mean for women as a whole? Yeah. Uh, you know, as an ecosystem, what does that mean? So that's kind yeah. of like, uh, and I guess been pondering on it, but I would say is we all have to look at the uh, invisible algorithms that are getting mm -hmm. developed. 85% of those algorithms are developed by men right now. Totally. What does that mean from a gender bias on a confirmation mm -hmm. bias? And are we going to impact and create more digital divide in the economic uh, um, yeah. uh, opportunity space. That's what, you know, whether they'll get a job or whether they'll get a mm -hmm. insurance. Those are the things I think about it. I don't know if I can break anything, but at least I can drive awareness for it. Yeah, and I think that you bring up so many great points, Chaitra, and so many that a lot of women will resonate with, um, you know, right from the the looks bias, right? It's like, I remember, so at every tech conference, you know, I I would just get like, you know, comments that would be like pretty much in harassment category. And, and it was like, we had to kind of crack the code with all the, you know, my, my women mentors, all my advisors, and they said, it's your long blonde hair. I mean, my hair is dark now, I just changed it. And it was interesting, because I was like, wow, like, and I would get comments on hair too, right? Like, oh, so you colored this hair, because you probably want to stand out. 
And it was just so interesting that everybody was focused on what I looked like versus the talent that I had. Um, and, and, and there was even this, um, this man at a, at a, at a conference um, in Toronto, a collision actually a couple of years ago, he came to our booth, we had a booth and he, he was speaking to my colleague and she was really like livid. So she came up to me and after he was gone and she said, did you just hear what he said? And I was like, no, because I was talking to some other attendees. And she mentioned that when she told him that Ahimera was the founder of the company, he could not believe it. He was like, oh, her, she looks like she works in marketing. How can she be the founder? So you're so, so right. True. Like so it, there, it, just, it exists. And it's like, well, anyway, so I, I do think that there, there's that in your talk, your uh, point about uh, Tesla is going to be building some more. We actually have Tesla. And one of the things that when we first got it, I noticed on um, our screen was that because it shows people, pedestrians walking around, right? So it, it, it looks like um, an older, older, I don't know, like color, but like older men. So all the people look like, like men walking around. So that was something I noticed. And my husband's like, you're reading too much into this. And I was like, no, like, it's interesting how it just anyway. So wow, like that is a little concerning, even though, you know, I think we need innovation and in all those spaces. But if women are not part of that, it's going to be Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Sorry, I got carried yeah. away with this topic. And Homera, like, I think uh, we saw that one at the Oscars too, right? Um, mm -hmm. Data was pull, uh, called on it because of her appearance yeah. of how she looked instead yeah. of her talent, right? Yeah. So we see that over and over again. And I know it's it's a talk of the town right now, yeah. but that is a appearance bias. So there was a bias and they said yeah. it mockingly, but it was not right. And mm -hmm. if you think about whatever the reason is, just respect people as people. That's kind yeah. of my um, yeah. ask of everybody. No, that's a great point. I, I also hope that, I mean, that was such an unfortunate event too, but I do hope that people can start to look beyond women's looks um, and focus more on their talents like they do with for the male counterparts. Mm -hmm. Um, that's great. I mean, this, this, yeah, we have a lot to say on this topic, but, um, let's look at what Thank advice you. you would give to any women faced with biases who may not have a supportive network. Wow. Um, first is, um, um, you have to build one and you have to build yeah. one with a trusted, um, relationships and you have to focus on start with one or two get your network right, right? It's really somebody you can trust in them. But my mm -hmm. perspective, um, you know, around um, advice here, I would say, I don't think I have a advice for all of you, but I think I have a perspective I can share. I think you need to know yourself first before, you know, going out and saving the planet and building the big network. You need to know your personal power you need yeah. to understand what your personal power is and nobody can break you unless you allow it to be. Uh, nobody can disrespect you if you allow people to disrespect you, of course. And I've yeah. seen that personally growing up. I really didn't understand what a personal power is. I always felt like the power was getting lost and somebody could just walk over you. And I'm like, mm. I didn't like it. I don't know why I couldn't speak up with. Mm. So that's the time I realized there are two worlds to work through. One is easy and boring life, which is you just can live in that world. People will say what you want and how it's going to be. And second is serving and being adventurous. That's the place it's difficult where you have to come out and serve people, be creative and allow you to learn about yourself a little bit more because when you're serving and, and being in an adventure state, you get to do a few things for yourself. One is you get to know who you are at the depth of who you are. I have written like five pages about myself, about what makes me tick, what gets me upset, what triggers me, uh, what makes me go out of the way to help people and why I do what I do and how do I break all these biases around me and how mm -hmm. do I spot it immediately? Second is what value do you bring to the world? So whatever that appearance bias, gender bias also should disappear because of the value you bring and yeah. you're differentiating yourself. And you also need to know who you are serving. You cannot serve everybody. You need to be very laser focused on how yeah. you serve. 
And then is what kind of adventure you're creating for you and the people around you. And once I kind of got that formula right, is knowing myself, knowing who I'm serving, knowing what I bring to the world, and was the kind of adventure I want to take every day, every year, every you know decade, it became very easier to lead the world with much more peace and happiness. Mm-hmm. And the people around me that I bring on is really my goal is to invest in growing them and developing them. So yeah. I don't yeah. really spend time as like, oh, they're working for me. I never think that way. So it's, this is my way of contributing to them and grow mm-hmm. their life and create a platform for them that they become the next leaders and I get to work for them. How cool that would be, right? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the journey I want to take. And that's kind of how, how I look at it is that's when you build a network and it automatically happens. So you yeah. don't have to really focus on networking. You're actually building a network. Yeah, that's a beautiful point, Chaitra, because uh, one of the things that has worked so well just in anything that I've seen successful is that people give before they take right? Mm-hmm. So finding that purpose and who you're serving and, and serving them. And then eventually you just build that amazing kind of like thought, you know, like-minded thought leaders around you. Um, and sure. yes, you do have to, you know, build that network and reach out and put yourself out there um, to have that, you know? Um, yeah. Anyway, I, I, I do think that having, they say that your network is your net worth. So true. So true. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what's the one bias, Chaitra, that you just cannot stand? And I know we've talked about some, but you always make sure to speak about uh, about this one particular bias and stand up. Sure. But I think we have like really good audience. Homera, can we ask the audience to us, what is one bias you just cannot mm-hmm. stand? And always make sure you speak about and stand up to. I want to know what people have to say. Because that's right. what we are interacting with each other, right? Yeah. But then I can talk about where um, I can stand. Since I do a lot of community work, uh, Homero, mm. and I do a lot of, yes, the gender, definitely, yes. So when I do the community work, there's a couple of things that I look for. I really look for people who are there to, to contribute to the greater good. Mm-hmm. And when I'm doing uh, work with uh, people, and we have our stage, which is a speaking platform. And I want to highlight them as really one of the thoughtful leaders, powerful leaders and influential leader. But there are two types of people who come in, in that journey. And that's where the superiority bias comes mm-hmm. in. Yeah. So, and I'm always looking for people who are not having that bias in them because they have in their mind, because they have a title or they have this big accomplishment and they feel like we are all working for them. And that's something for me is no knowing in my mind. Mm -hmm. I feel as we are helping each other because you have a title doesn't mean that you're superior to us. Yeah, You're superior when you have added value to people's life and help them realize their dreams and their vision. Mm -hmm. So when an entrepreneur comes in and says, hey, I need access into the company into the supplier ecosystem, then they don't really make that happen. That ticks me, really mm-hmm. ticks me off. And I'm like, you have the door to open and you have the key to open. Why aren't you opening it? That's a superiority bias in action because mm-hmm. they want you to serve them in a way so then only they'll open. So that's what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Then when you're speaking on the stages, I have people who are Madonnas and they're pre-Madonnas. So people who are Madonnas who are very easy, they will make time to come and do the best thing, but they're pre Madonnas that I have in my ecosystem too. And I'm only like, okay, usually that's the time. I'm like, that's when I know there's a superiority bias happening in their mind. And they think they're doing me a favor. And I'm like, no, you're not doing me a favor. We are doing a favor. The community is doing a favor to recognize you, that you are a leader and come here and serve. So when they create too much tax for the organization and the community, that's the time I stand up and say, no, no, for it. no prima donnas in our ecosystem. We are all role models. We are all champions. We are all influencer. Let's hold mm-hmm. hands together and make a difference because this is the time we can. And if we can do it, then who else can? 
but yeah. we need to have like-minded people. So for me, it's like looking at the superiority bias all the time and yeah. always assessing that as strategically as possible. So we do not bring that mindset and say to the community, that's okay to have that. So that's yeah. why when people come into the Women in Cloud ecosystem, they have to be extremely aware that everybody's a Madonna. Own it, have your personal presence. There's no pre-Madonnas in our ecosystem. So that's kind of my <laughs> point of view. Just I love of- it. I love it. Uh, now you can all probably tell why we have um, why we have Chaitra here. Uh, that's so true. I think it, it I, I, I mean, I have thoughts and I have follow-up questions um, on that, but we do have questions um, and comments from the audience here. Um, Mayara mentions gender bias. So that's definitely one of the big ones. Um, and she also acknowledges actually that she has found herself doing it recently. Uh, mm-hmm. So maybe you're talking about Mayara the the <laughs> um, it's good that you acknowledge that though um so the gender bias there's also um elizabeth's asking do you think other women face biases from other women absolutely i think the superior bias activates and the beauty or the appearance bias gets activated among women and that gets very well you can see it in every event every room every conversation you know it when you see it um and Mm -hmm. when you see it you say i'm not going to be part of it i'm going to stop that one and then is when you have conquered your own bias yeah that's that's great that's awesome (laughs) thank you Uh, natasha also mentioned uh being a boss means i need to portray masculine traits that somehow i'm not a business owner entrepreneur unless i can be a hammer to my team constantly fighting against this So yeah. well, what is the question? Uh, there's, I guess that's a comment, the masculine traits, like unless, you know, you, uh, being a boss means that she needs to portray those masculine traits. What do you have to say about that, Chaitra? I, I don't think you need to, but that's just me. Just be who you are and be who you are, own it. Don't have to mimic anybody. Nobody has to do. If you mm-hmm. are, um, uh, if you are a leader or if you are leading a company, or you're leading an organization, be authentic to yourself because the energy that you put in to have that imposter syndrome, which is Mm -hmm. whether you have a masculine skills or you don't, I think you lose yourself through that process. Don't lose yourself. I think you're so powerful and you just can bring your own personal power. Just be authentic because people can read between um, truth and a lie very easily. It's just mm-hmm. how your body behaves, the way you say it. Um, for me, is I will say it as it is. You know, if I don't like it, I'll say it's not working. Yeah. If they don't like it, just walk away from there. But point mm-hmm. is, we have to be true to what we do every day. Yeah. Instead of um, trying to change ourselves to meet to the community or the group, yeah. just bring your own self as authentically as possible. That would be my just my suggestive Mm -hmm. um, advice if you're open to it yeah I also do think that that is also how we can change the face of leadership um, is to be able to share I lead this way I'm a great leader this is what also leadership can look like Um, that's a great point Chaitra Uh, somebody also mentions bias and leadership style Um, not all all men are not uh, agentic leaders I don't know what that means. And all women are not com- communal leaders. Uh, women can be, uh, is it agentic? Agentic leaders with bold action styles and men can be communal leaders who are more supportive and caring. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. And I think, and I think uh, Homera, I think very well stated. I think the leadership is, is a quality of serving people. It doesn't have to have a style, like, I don't think you need to have a specific style. If you know how to take care of people, because every person needs a different style of engaging. Mm-hmm. I have on my team who likes direct feedback. Some people like visually like want to work through. Uh, people like to work in group setting to de- personally develop, like meet the needs for what they're looking for. At the end of the day, one of the questions I always try to really focus on is what matters to them at this moment. 
Mm -hmm. If you can address, if you can address what matters to them, then I think you are a perfect leader at that time because you're caring, you're serving, and you're also developing them to become their best self. And that's what leadership does. Mm -hmm. uh, leadership is not about standing on a pedestal and saying, I did this one because there are thousands of people making that happen. So yeah, it's, it's really, a, it's a really, I would say a skill that you have to develop about taking care of others. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for sharing that. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people also, you know, I mean, they would start companies or join companies for titles. And that ends up not working out so well for obvious reasons. So thank you for sharing that. And also, Cheryl, thank you for your comments about what, um, yeah, I, I wasn't so sure about that. But um, Cheryl mentions that agentic is associated with masculine and communal is associated with feminine, yet gender is a spectrum and leadership style is very greatly based on um, the person, not the gender. So true. 100%. Um, we have um, one more question, Chaitra, and then we can see if you know, our community has um, any more questions for you. So who or what helps you get through challenging situations? Oh, boy. Aren't we all in challenging world right now from COVID to war to inflation? Boy, every day is challenging. Yeah. And I think about it, I don't know how we are surviving through it and also thriving at the same time. Um, but here is how I kind of deal through it. Um, I, I actually have, I like to have a long time with myself where I can introspect, think clear, so that I'm really rational with my emotion because as a human, we are very irrational because of the bias we have and the upbringing mm -hmm. that we have. So I have to have that time to think and whenever my emotions are pretty much stirred uh, throughout the day from one meeting to another to conversation and uh, sometimes gaslighting, sometimes mm -hmm. you know issues and crisis that we are going on. I like to have that alone time with myself just to think through and be true to myself. The second one that I really go through is validating conversation on ideas or directional decision with my personal board of directors. So that way I know is I can rely on them, whether it's finance mm -hmm. or legal or approach, or maybe even just as my emotional state that I'm going through. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the time I'll tell you, it was like right before December, like I would think it was November. Uh, I, I don't think I've never felt that helpless in my life because my son was leaving to abroad for the, in the midst of COVID. My mom was not doing well. There were just a lot of issues with everybody having COVID and the family mm -hmm. was struggling. The community needed more attention because just a lot of things going on. Yeah. I remember that day I felt like I felt like everything was falling apart. I sat down, I called my best friend. She said, let all the balls that is in the air, let it fall down. Just sit there and take a breather. It will be fine. And I remember getting that validation that I could take a break yeah. and not try to fix everything, which is usually what um, uh, every human does. Is they want to fix everything when something is going wrong. And that validation of that you could take a break and you needed that external voice mm -hmm. that made a world of difference. So whenever I feel that, I'm like, it's okay. Let it go down. We'll figure it out. Everything is fine. We'll get it back up. You don't have to be perfect. Yeah. So that's the one I would say having a validating conversation with your uh, personal board of directors. The third is with my family. I don't think I can do anything without my family. Uh, my kids are amazing. They understand when I'm going through a very challenging situation. My younger one is so amazing. He'll say, mom, let's go grab a cup of coffee. I'll drive you to a coffee place. And he'll say, what is that challenging? Tell me the emotion because he's going to take me psychology right now. Nice. <laughs> he's, he's helping me. He wants very to be a psychologist fitting. for me. He's like, tell me about the challenging situation you're going through. And it's not that he's actually answering it. He's just helping me process it. Yeah. So that's been very fantastic. My older one is like, mom, let's sit down and let's put everything on a piece of paper and you'll find what the breakdown is. So I have mm -hmm. like two boys who are really good. But I, I think I also want to give like a lot of credit to my husband. He's really a friend and a partner. Um, and I don't think I can really do what I do without him. Uh, he'll take, he will listen to every rant on the world. 
he will understand all the scenarios and then he'll say, okay, what is the answer? What, what do you want to, me to fix? Or what do you want to fix? And I say, I don't want to fix it. I just want somebody to listen. Yeah. And he will listen and having a companion like him, in spite of I had an arranged marriage, I got lucky. So it was really helpful to kind of go through a very challenging situation very effectively. Most of the hmm. time I can solve it being in an alone time where I can figure it out. But when I don't, I have my you know, friends and then I have my family who will sort it out. So I think I've got yeah. that. If not anything, start cooking and serving people. I think you'll get that answer. <laughs> That's wonderful. That sounds great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think um, spending time alone can be really challenging too, because that's when all the, you know, sometimes, you know, you know what you should do, you know what you have to do. Uh, but it's so great to have um, your time with yourself, but also with people that love and care about you and will listen. Sometimes all you need is a listener. So um, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Now I'm gonna um, just pass it on to some of our um, attendees here today. If you wanna ask Chaitra any questions around the topic of break the bias um, and uh, otherwise we have some too, but we wanna make room for and space for others to ask questions. Don't be shy, drop them in the chat. Yeah, please ask. I think. It's good to have questions to talk about, right? Exactly. And only we can find answers to it. And thank you so much for having me recall in my mouth and doing this interview. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, so we have a question. Um, what are your suggestions for workplaces and leadership to take tangible action if there seems to be a problem with the bias at the company? whether it's diversity bias, lack of women, lack of structures in combating bias, um, anything you can suggest? Perfect. So Homera, uh, can I do a plug for the event tomorrow that we have? Sure. And so tomorrow we are doing is Mastering Executive Leadership and is the Women in Cloud uh, IWD event. We are the last event closing the whole uh, International yeah. Women's Month. And there are like seven leaders who are talking about that. And I've, I'm going to give you all a free access to the event. Please come and listen, because I think they will talk about how to think about as a um, influencer in the ecosystem and um, how to tackle the bias. Because mm -hmm. I think you need to hear from women leaders who know how to do it well. I can tell yeah. you from my perspective, but when you hear different people going through that journey, that is when you know is um, you know how to address it because there are very different types of biases that you mm -hmm. see and you need to tackle. You need to be an inspector of the biases. You mm -hmm. need to know how to inspect when you see it. And it, the first thing is it will trigger your emotion, right? It will say, something is wrong, I'm off. Like I was watching Oscars, immediately my body said, not, not right, yeah. very, not, not a right call. I could feel it. But then I sat down and said, why did I feel what I felt? That's when you become inspectors of that feeling and say, what was the bias that got activated? What was mm -hmm. the thinking that got activated? And then you kind of figure out what is happening in meetings, in uh, emails, and in how the CEO is talking about it, how the leaders mm -hmm. are talking about it. The language, because the language is the one which will trigger and the body posture will trigger again. Mm -hmm. So once you see those things, then you start to say, okay, let me create as a coalition within your organization to tackle that. This is not one person's responsibility, neither it's an HR's responsibility, it's a collective responsibility. Yeah. So you have to be first aware of what is triggering you and why you are the right champion to go tackle that within the company. That would yeah. be my take. But I would like all of you to come and learn from the leaders because they will give you the answers that you're looking for. That's great. We would love to even follow up with the link. And Chaitra, if you have that, you can share that here and sure. we'll be sure to share with everybody. Um, sure. We have a question um, is what would the best way to call people out on bias? Feedback on the spot or in private? Uh, so say it again. Uh, what would be the best way to call people out on a bias? So if you see it happening and somebody's doing it, should we give feedback on the spot or privately? I always like private feedback, not ever 
lash, you know, because if you lash out in public, actually your reputation is at risk. And always guard your reputation as number one asset on the planet. Once that goes, everything goes. So mm -hmm. always reach out to the person and try to understand why they said what they said. Yeah. And then basically say, here's how I felt. This is what I saw. Is that how you wanted to react? And is this how you want your reputation to look like? Usually when you talk about someone's personal brand, usually they'll back off and they are more open to listening. So kind of focus on them. And mm -hmm. sometimes you'll realize it's something stemming from the childhood, something from their upbringing, something for the way they have been groomed and they've yeah. been told. So it's really not personal. Sometimes they don't even know that's happening. So yeah. that's my thing is personal. Yeah. I would ask though, uh, you know, as a, as a, thank you Chaitra uh, for sharing that and discount code too, complimentary. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much Chaitra. That's amazing. And I've attended so many of your events there. I always take something away and I'll do my best to join that as well. Um, oh, that yeah, of course. Um, and one of the things too is though, like if you see, say in a room and just a, just something that came to mind, I get asked this a lot. So, you know, if you're in a room of people um, and, you know, there's very few women and a male colleague says something inappropriate or uh, almost like um, to make the other person feel less, you know, in front of everybody. Sure. As as the other one of the few women, is it like can we say something? Should we say something? Like what do you, what what are your thoughts on that? It all really depends upon the situation, Humera. I I we have to look at situation by situation. Some needs to handle personally. Something needs to be handled openly. Mm -hmm. But if the person has felt it really personally, right? Um, it's important for the person to speak up and say what they are going through. It's very important to acknowledge. Yeah. Uh, having the third person say for them or a second person to say for them, um, basically they are actually representing their emotion to others rather than the person who's going through that emotion. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mm -hmm. speak up, you're actually giving your personal power away to someone else. So I would yeah. say is own your personal power, have the courage to talk about it. If you don't, then no one can talk as perfectly as you can for yourself. If you can't mm -hmm. defend yourself, don't expect others to defend for you. So yeah. my thing is, if, if you felt really bad, if there was a leader in the room and you felt that one was not right, um, you should always talk to them and say, this is how I felt. I would yeah. like you to kind of put some good boundaries for everybody so they don't cross in the next meeting and they're making yeah. an acknowledgement of it. Yeah. Uh, when you are a leader and you felt something was wrong, um, I had one of those instances, uh, I would say a couple of months ago, I literally had to call out, say, I don't like it. You're snapping and I don't like that behavior. Immediately yeah. had to cut it off. It, was, it felt rude for them, really yeah. rude. But I also had to say that kind of boundaries, that kind of behavior is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. By demeaning somebody or saying something about somebody was not good. People did not like, the team did not like it, but I said, I will put my foot down when things yeah. are not right. When the team member is disrespecting the other team member, snapping and being rude or bel belittling them, that should mm -hmm. not be acceptable in a yeah. collaborative environment. That's amazing. And I know it can be hard for a lot of people to do that, but it's so important because then you're setting that example mm -hmm. for others too, right? Like if you sure. let it go, then it perhaps could mean that it's acceptable. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, any other questions from uh, the audience here? We have such a great group. I know some of them, but uh, I would love to see if you have any questions around, you know, biases in the workplace that perhaps you have faced or you have seen others go through or perhaps something that you get, um, you know, you are open to seeing how you can help navigate that for your teams. I'm gonna make a little bit more space and then I'll, I do have a question.
Okay, well, um, if there are, we'll, we'll happily take them. Uh, but in the meantime, um, Taitra, what are some of the best resources you can suggest for people in tackling bias, uh, whether that's books, uh, whether that's people should set up ERGs? And actually, I do have a question on ERGs, but what are some of the resources you can suggest? Sure. Um, first is um, there are lots of books. You should go to Amazon.com and uh, you can look for the best of the books. There's a new book called as um, um, by Ruchika. Ruchika, I cannot get her last name, but it's about really about bringing inclusion in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think if I can find it, uh, Homera, yeah. it just got released. Uh, she was, um, uh, uh, she actually wrote for Harvard Business Review and really very okay. good writer, talks about a lot of the bias issues for the BIPOC ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And uh, what does, what do we need to think about? How do we need to think about that? So yeah. very well done. I think I would recommend you to read her book. The other thing is there are tons of things on Forbes. I would say just go and search for bias and you'll get at least 100 to 200 articles yeah get familiar with that um third is like really if you have someone who in your organization helping um around the bias piece and helping set up like some uh, learning moments for the team mm -hmm. and my best thing is i usually put a tedx talk on bias and we have a um, conversation with few women like my personal That's a good idea owner. Just do it, talk about it, and learn about it. And TED Talks are multiple uh, bias mm -hmm. related talks out there. So it gives you a very different perspective. That's kind of how I go about learning any yeah. topic. Um, if you really want to really know, join one or two communities and be active about it. Learn about your own self growth around, you know, manage learning about yourself. Yeah. And then you talk about how you can solve the problem at your work. Like it's not someone else's job. It's actually your job to be part of a collective change that you want to create. Yeah. So that would be the one. Now, coming to the ERG, there's a lot of ERG groups that are getting created. Right yeah. now, Homera from Women in Cloud, we are doing a lot of um, transformation work in helping the corporate ESG program, which is environmental social and governance work mm -hmm. around really including this whole notion of developing women leaders who are actually leading the ESG work within the company. Mm -hmm. As part of that accelerator, which is the ESG corporate leadership accelerator, we want women to really look at the bias, look at all these you know things that need to be driven for creating an inclusive economic world that we want. Mm -hmm. That would allow us to help them develop them, help them develop the right ERG communities to really drive yeah. the change. That's the kind of the intention. And I would love to work closely with you because you work with the ERG groups very closely. And they're mm -hmm. all looking for answers for how to solve it. Yeah. You need to have a contextual work which connects to the CEO scorecard and the yeah. board scorecard. If that doesn't financially is not connected, nothing else happens. It's a corporate world. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. I would love to absolutely explore that. I do think that, you know, one of the things I did a lot of interviews with ERG um, leaders um, and one of the things that really stood out was that a lot of ERG spaces are created, you know, to provide a safe space for people. And I say this because that's the challenge. Safe spaces for people, uh, you know, underrepresented communities to join, right? The problem, there's two problems. One is that they struggle to actually create a safe environment. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the ROI piece, like you mentioned, right? If you cannot even show the business ROI, at the end of the day, executive leadership may cut budgets. If you don't utilize those budgets, they're not going to get renewed. And so there's so many challenges there. And obviously, I would love to kind of pick this up with you another time, but I, cause it's such, so close to my heart. Cause I think it's like all these people who are dedicating so much time in creating this, this, this channel, this group. And yeah. if at the end of the day, it doesn't serve the core purpose of providing that safe space, then it's just, yeah, it's a wasted opportunity. Um, 
We do have a um, comment and question here. I really like how you've articulated superiority bias. I have a feeling that I've internalized a bit of inferiority bias after years of navigating workplace rife with superiority bias. Do you have any thoughts on how to break one's internal internalized inferiority bias and how to step into personal power? Oh, wow. that is such a great question. Oh, my God. That's mm -hmm. a good one. That's a powerful one. Uh, yeah. When you see inferiority and if you feel that, you will get the, like, when you see the superiority, you will feel the inferiority. It's mm. kind of the opposite of it. And I would say it's mostly, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not an extrovert. I'm kind of in the middle of an introvert and an extrovert. And um Inferiority bias usually happens, usually driven through envy and jealousy mm. um, because you can't do what the other person is doing and you're kind of like struggling to figure out why it is. And you need to first conquer that feeling or maybe say any other feeling. You need to find what it is that that's causing you feel inferior. And sometimes it is your appearance. It may be sometimes it's your eloquency in how you speak. It may be somebody who told you in your childhood that you're not good enough. A lot of things that goes with it. First, mm -hmm. you have to normalize yourself, saying, why do I feel what I feel? And then you take action after that. Um, yeah. I cannot find, because I'm not a therapist, uh, I don't have an answer. But the thing is that you have to discover yourself. If you ever feel inferior, it's probably somebody said something to you or something happened in your life where you see something and that gets triggered. And uh, the trigger can be multiple reasons. It can be, you know, somebody is doing really well. Some, so you want to get something, but you cannot accomplish it. There's something that's happening in your world. So you need to explore that a little bit more closely. Yeah. And once you do it, then you say, do I really want what the other person wants? You know, usually will say, no, I don't want mm -hmm. that life because that's not the life I want, but there is something that got triggered in your mind. Yeah. And because of that, when it gets triggered, you come across where you're already closed and you're not your true self. And that's when you lose the opportunity. Yeah. Um, you don't speak up. That's a great point. It just brings back memories of, you know, growing up in, in Karachi, Pakistan, you know, there's a huge class system there. So if you're not if you're not rich or if you don't have certain car or whatever that might be, you know, growing up, it, we had a lot of that money inferiority or superiority, depending on where you were. Um, and and oh, it's, it's been so hard to break that. But obviously, Canada has humbled a lot of us, yes. <laughs> which is when great immigration does that to you. Um, and then you also learn, you know, what truly matters to you. And, and is that really important? I've had a lot of friends in the past that, you know, around them, I would feel that way, I would feel inferior. Um, and then it was my internalized, you know, kind of bias or um, complex, I would say. And then over time, I'm just like, it doesn't matter. You know, it really doesn't matter. Um, but um, <laughs> thank you for sharing. <laughs> Immigration definitely is humbling for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, that, that's so true. I think there is, you know, once you learn, um, yeah, I, I, w one thing actually just came to mind um, is that when I started to public do a lot of public speaking and because I knew that I had to get out there, put myself out there and, and be, you know, my authentic self and it's been a journey. But I remember for a long time, I just would, and even today, like sometimes I get really nervous. Um, but the reason for my nervousness has changed. Initially, it was like, what are people going to think? Am I looking okay? Am I presenting okay? What if I don't say the right word? Because, you know, I may, I'm, I still call myself ESL from time to time, because I, I may say something that you may not understand. Um, and so there were a lot of those things. And then one day I realized, like, if I move uh, the focus or shift the focus from my looks to what I have to say, which is why people are there, you know, I'm not a Kardashian, like people are not here to see, see my looks. People are here to listen to what I have to say. So I've been focusing on that. And then, you know, pictures started to come and there were, sometimes there would be pictures where I, I, my previous self would have said, no, 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 you can't put that out there. And I was like, you know what? Don't care because I don't want personally to focus on what I'm looking like in any given photo. So it takes time, you know, you have to work on yourself and um, yeah, and be brave. So thank you so much, uh, Natalie, for asking and Chaitra for that beautiful answer. Um, that's, uh, 
That's great. Well, we're coming up to time. If there's any final questions for Chaitra, Chaitra, thank you so much. I mean, I know you're not feeling well and you know, you're, you're showing up, you're making it work. So we appreciate it. We're not going to keep you longer if people don't have questions, but this has been really, really um, enlightening. Uh, we do have a question. Um, it was once widely believed that being an extrovert with a superiority bias is the way to succeed at work. It obviously stems from an extremely patriarchal system that rewards individualistic, egoistic, destructive behaviors. It is now said that introverts may actually be better leaders because they are more observant and have been in the inferiority space and actually get the work done instead of getting by with just charms. What has your experience been with that? or in that regard? Chaitra, did you get the question? Yes, I did. I think my network is a little bit yeah, yeah. body. Hopefully it's yeah. working. Um, boy, um, I mean, I wish I could answer that question because I, I, I'm looking at it and I can say is coming from India and coming from um, um, the, my parents were in uh, army. So we traveled all over India and um, there were places where we were safe and the places we were not safe. And, um, and it was extremely hard um, to go through the journey of when we were not feeling safe because there are a lot of times you look at it and you say, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Why am I going through it? At that time, you basically follow a specific set of instruction. And I'm glad my parents gave that instruction at that time. So we didn't get go into a destructive path. But when you think about just getting by with just charms, I, I, I would say charm is a presence in people's you know, it's, it's a developed skill. Uh, people who can charm, they actually are very intelligent too. They have put in a lot of work to get ready and that's the presence they have developed it. So I, I have, we have to give credit for them. It's, you may just see beauty because that's your appearance bias. But when you really think about it, you're like, how can they talk so good? How can they present so good? How can they close all those deals? How is that possible? Because somewhere in their journey, they made a pivot saying that they want to be very influential and they're mm -hmm. going to work at it. And they will put in all the things, the, the formula that uh, you need to be very successful. So I'll give you a very simple example of that. I've, I joined Oracle when um, I would say my first job in tech was at Oracle. Within six years, I became a director. Not because um, I just was given a, a you know a easy route to getting the the role that I needed, which is going and working in the Oval Office there. Um, but it was the deal that I closed, the way I showed up, the way I talked to the customers. But if when someone sees it, they say, "Oh, she got very lucky." It was not luck at all. Yes, the mm -hmm. luck was there because I prepared for that instance and. The charm was created because I was able to eloquently articulate that particular need for the market and really show up well and also make the company look very good in front of the yeah. customer. So it's really about looking. I, I always look at charm as really a skill, but it takes a lot of effort. You have to pay attention. That's why it starts from inside you. And you need to know that you have to put in a full package. If you're getting out into the workplace, mm -hmm. there is a package that it's called as executive presence. And if you have that yeah. right, then you will grow. Yeah, that's such a beautiful perspective, Chaitra. One of the things I will say is though that when people say, you know, I think luck can be a factor in a lot of, it's about timing, right? Like if you have been working hard for one and on one thing for so long, maybe if you haven't given up, there will be timing that will resonate with with the work that you've done and then you will shine. It's, it's not overnight. So thank you for sharing that because I do think that a lot of people who are successful and especially in the public speaking um, you know, space, they have had to work very hard to get to that presence. So the executive presence you talk about, um, that's amazing. Thank that you so much. Thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, the best thing for anyone who wants to develop exec presence, go and speak on stages and ability to speak on the spot. And any question they ask, that you're able to kind of answer it. If you can get that with confidence without getting, you know, flustered, then you will get automatically, you'll get the presence because yeah. the public speaking is a very unique skill you have to develop. I didn't develop till 35, actually. It was hard for me. And then, mm -hmm. then my manager said, if you have to grow, Chaitra, you have to really get it right. So, spend, so I got a coach, I worked on Toastmasters, worked through the piece, but that is a very important element of, uh, you know, charm, building your charm. Yeah. Yeah. So charm is built. <laughs> That's <a> amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, I trust So many golden nuggets here. We're going to be putting this together in a blog post format. Uh, we'll be sure to share that with you too, Chaitra, for any feedback if you have any. Uh, we'll be, this is recorded, so we'll be sharing it with everybody and those who were not able to join us as well. But thank you again so much, especially again, this is what I say to everybody. You showed up. I mean, you're not well. And I mean, so, so I really appreciate it, but people show up, show up for yourself, show up for the community, do what you can. And let's all, I think it's a collective. One thing you said, Chaitra, really, I wish for everybody to know this. It's not HR's job. It's not just the leader's job. It's everybody's collective job to make sure that we're breaking that bias and moving the needle faster. So thank you so much. Um, Really you. such a pleasure to have you and hope you're feeling better soon. And thank you all for joining us today and ending a Women's History Month with a with a huge bang. So thank you. Thank you, Hamara, for having me. <laughs>